A seminary in Virginia built with slavery and Jim Crow labor is creating a program that's one of the first of its kind, providing cash reparations to descendants of black Americans who were forced to work there. The Virginia Theological Seminary started the program in February, authorizing payments to the members of the generation closest to the original workers. Fifteen people have received payments so far, but that number is expected to rise as genealogists comb through more and more records. Dean and President of Virginia Theological Seminary, Reverend Ian S. Marka, joins us now for more on this. Reverend, thanks for being here. Tell us a little bit about how this idea for reparations started. So we're on the cusp of celebrating our 200th milestone as an institution, and we felt morally obligated as Christians to do the work of reflecting on the journey of those 200 years and acknowledge that part of that journey is the cruel participation in the institution of slavery and subsequently Jim Crow. And that needs to be recognized and lifted up. We're very inclined, I think, a lot of institutions to do everything we can to forget about our past. And in the end, that's not the right thing to do, nor the Christian thing to do. And Reverend Martin, can I follow up on that about what, what that work, as you say, what it is, that kind of soul work, what does it accomplish for some people who may ask? At this date, with the direct victims of this cruelty long gone, what are we accomplishing with this reparations program, if I may? So it's a basic moral axiom uh, that one should receive compensation for labor. Uh, we all benefit from it. I suspect you're paid and I'm certainly paid and uh, we think that's right and proper. And then you're allowed to do with that money what you will. Uh, and part of what we all do and everybody does is uh, leave something to our estate and to those who come after us. So the act of denying compensation to all those who were enslaved and those who worked under Jim Crow, who earned significantly less than their white counterparts, was, was wrong, immoral. Uh, we exploited those who worked for us in cruel and wicked ways. So uh, if you're going to repent of what you've done in the past, you need to make amends. That too is a fundamental Christian axiom. Uh, put them together. You have to recognize that the descendants of those whose labor we exploited are still disadvantaged. They did not receive the estate they would have inherited if that compensation had been given to their forebears. And therefore, we need to do a little to repair, to make amends, to make a difference to those descendants. And Reverend, we've seen other institutions create similar programs, but rarely cash reparations. How did you decide to go with cash payments here? And what's the process been like, the research process, to try to locate these former workers and then their descendants? So starting with the research question, I mean, that's been really interesting and complicated, as you can imagine. Um, so we've got, it's bi-directional. Uh, we work both in the period uh, before the Civil War, our founding in 1823 and up to the Civil War. And that's largely working with archival sources, both at the seminary and at Mount Vernon. Um, and it's very moving. Julia Parker, for example, was born in 1823, the year of our founding. At the tender age of 21, uh, we paid John Augustus Washington III, who then owned Mount Vernon, the princely sum of $12 um, for her labor for three months. Uh, she was 21. I know what a 21-year-old looks like. My son is 24. And, you know, it, it adds a real depth to the acknowledgement of the sin when you have a person and you can actually sort of understand a little of what that person must have felt as they navigated life um, as a 21 year old on the campus. Uh, and therefore we have to do that hard work of, of archival work. And then the other way we go is from many of the African American communities in Alexandria have connections going back before the Civil War with the seminary, uh, have fathers and grandfathers and uncles and great grandfathers who worked on the campus. So put together, we were then able to identify the descendants Descendants. And you're right, we are unique in actually making cash payments. But let's go back to the general principle here. You know, labor should be compensated. 
And people shouldn't be told by other people what to do with the compensation they're given. You know, if you, when you inherited money from those who've gone before uh, as in their estate, uh, you didn't have anybody telling you how that money should be spent. So all we're doing here is we're just making a direct payment in acknowledgement for the fact that they should have been paid when they worked for the seminary. The estates have been disadvantaged. And we're not going to tell descendants how to spend the money that they are entitled to. Uh, the sadness in all this, actually, is it's, it's modest. You know, and that's one of the things that I'm very aware of, is the importance of trying to uh, make this a real tangible connection. So it's not just the direct payment that matters, it's also the relationship we're building with those descendants. Hmm. And let me ask, there are 15 people, I understand, from six different families have received payments so far. How is it being received by these descendants and what can we expect to see from the program in the future? Well, the, the, the numbers will grow. And um, one very important part of all this is building the relationship with these families because these human lives, their forebears were not honoured on the campus. Such was the brutality of both uh, before the Civil War and, and Jim Crow. Uh, so therefore, part of it is building relationship. Uh, the, all the participants in the program are welcome to eat in our refectory on the campus uh, for lunch every day when the refectory is open. So there's a whole host of initiatives that run parallel with this. And I think what you'll see is, is uh, th this program will grow. Uh, and the descendants, some are pleased that, albeit it's, it's small and, um, you know, that we're at least doing something uh, to acknowledge. You, you know, people worry about council culture. Trust me, uh, you know, white institutions, predominantly white institutions, love counselling and forgetting about the past. They, they just want a generic slavery. They want a generic Jim Crow. They don't want to know it was Julia Parker, who was 21 years old, who was the person who worked for three months and the $12 that her labor was, was paid for went to somebody entirely different, John Augustus Washington III. We want to cancel that. So what we're trying to do is, is some beneficiaries are pleased. And yeah, sure, there are some who say to me, look, this is too little, too late. Um, we're still hurt and violated and angry. And I get that reaction too. Uh, but the right thing to do, you know, and in the end, these are just basic Christian values. The right thing to do when uh, institutions have sinned is to do the work of recognition, do the work of repentance, do the work of repair, and do the work of creating a future that's different uh, for those we're able to reach and touch. And that's what we're trying to do. And Reverend, on a wider scale, the conversation around reparations on a federal level has grown over the past couple of years. And while support for that has also grown, it's still a very controversial and divisive topic. And I just wonder, having now worked on this project and worked on this firsthand, is there, are there elements to that conversation that you feel a lot of people are missing when they think about this issue? I think that, I think there are elements. You know, I, I think the, the temptation for white America uh, is that we want to apologize for what happened in the past. We don't mind promising the future will be different, but we don't really want to go back and acknowledge that these human lives weren't compensated, their estates were disadvantaged, and as a result, those living now uh, are, have, have, you know, been denied uh, the fruits of their forebears' labours. And uh, in the end, you know, we can't just carry on doing the easy things here. Apologies in the end cost us nothing. Promising the future will be different cost us nothing. But doing the work of remembering and doing the work of actually trying to repair that past in some way, however modest, that we don't want to touch. And I think that one of the reasons why uh, race relations in the United States are continuing to be difficult is white America just doesn't want to go back. We don't want to remember and we don't want to do anything about it. And uh, finally, uh, African Americans are saying, look, you know, you can't just imagine that the apology and the promise of the future will be different is sufficient, partly because we don't carry credibility. 
So I do think that uh, other institutions should be thinking in comparable ways. And I think in the end, the United States needs to. Um, and just to reassure you, even though I have an English accent, I am an American citizen. I became one in 2010, and I'm very proud to be an American. All right, Reverend Ian S. Markham, a great conversation. We appreciate your time today. Thank you. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.